Do you wonder why you're losing support among Hispanic and black voters? And it's been going on for the last several years. I mean, Joe Biden secured 63 percent of the Hispanic vote. Now he has a 28 percent approval number. That, that's an enormous drop with Hispanic voters. So when you look at the, the cities, you look at where a lot of people of all different backgrounds live, they do not feel safe. They want police to protect them mm-hmm. and they want to know that when people do get caught, they're actually going to be off the street for more than 12 hours. Right. And when you talk about what the president's got to be concerned about, and that is blue collar Hispanic voters, he lost blue collar white voters already, blue collar Hispanic voters. But not only they're not just saying I'm I'm not supporting you. They're saying I'm supporting Republicans. And do you remember, Martha, you would be covering this stuff live. The the conventional thought was if you say bad things about the border, I want to put a fence and wall up, you don't like Hispanic people, you're losing the Hispanic vote. That was part of the autopsy Mm -hmm. that uh, Reince Priebus put together. That's right. Look, don't don't talk mean about the border. And I thought, what does that have to do with it? If you're here legally, you should be upset by that. It turns out they're upset by that. They're upset Mm -hmm. by what's happening right now. Well, here's what happens with every immigrant group that comes to the United States, right? They come and they're the Irish or they're the Italian or, you know, but then then they become Americans and Hispanics and and minorities are they're American voters now. Okay, that that delineation is not what it was before. Democrats cannot count on that vote. And also it just flies in the face of this idea that, oh, you know, everybody who comes across the border because we let them come across the border is going to be a Democrat voter. Because what you're finding is that the larger population of Hispanic voters are, are siphoning off the top because they're they're Americans and they want people to live by the rules and they want to have a safe community to live in and they don't want to be treated like a, you know, an identity group anymore. So Saturday after this uh, woman uh, gets pushed on the subway horrifically at 40 years old and there was a big candlelight vigil last night, uh, Eric Adams shows up and says, I, I don't want you guys to be dissuaded by this. Uh, the subways are safe. Yeah. So he tried to amend that. And you tell me if you think he was effective. Here's a little of the speech, cut 13. Yes, we must deal with crime in real time. But yes, there's some things that we can do every day. By saying hello, good morning, and interacting with each other. And no longer allowing our city to be an isolated city where we lean into the places we disagree instead of the places we agree. This is New York City, the most diverse place on the globe. It's time for us to come together as a city and not allow these issues to take place. My heart goes out to this family. I ask the press to please allow the family to mourn, give them the privacy that they deserve, and I ask all of us to see why we're members of the greatest race alive, and that's the human race. So a little of his uh, remarks yesterday, and then he went on to say that when I'm on the subway, I was scared. He goes, my first day as mayor, I went on the subway, I was scared, I heard the screaming, I heard the yelling, I saw the homeless. Yeah, And that's dramatically different than what he said on Saturday. Yeah, you know, this is sort of a common um, line of thinking among certain groups in New York City and in other cities, I imagine as well, that that it's just a perception. The numbers haven't really changed that much. Crime isn't that bad. When it happens to you, you yeah. I mean, when you lose your 40-year-old daughter, mother, sister, and when you look at what happened in California when your 24-year-old graduate student daughter works in a um, in a furniture store and someone walks, th- these are, these people deserve, they, they not deserve, they need to be in an institution. They need to be somewhere where people can care for them. This man in New York, his own sister said she couldn't believe that he was allowed out on the street because she was, he, she knew that he was clearly a threat. Couple that with the other stories that we have covered very closely, the 21 children under the age of 21 in New York who've been murdered, the two teenage boys in Chicago who've been murdered. So this is not just a story for, you know, um, you know, for these two women. This is a story for all of these young people who have lost their lives in a very unsafe environment. What Eric Adams needs to say is, I'm a former cop. I'm a former transit cop. You were going to make these subways safe. End of story. And I will not come back to you until I have until you are seeing an increased presence of police down there when people are prosecuted for the crimes that they commit and when you feel markedly safer. And he should set a deadline. Give me five months to make you feel safer in New York City and watch me. Right. Now the train's about to go up. Yesterday I had to wait. Usually I'll hop on on 42nd Street and not get the letter, but I'll get the number trains. And um, yesterday I went. The best thing is because when they get there quick and you miss a train, you got to wait 40 minutes. 
So I'm trying to get there quick, and I had to wait seven minutes for a train, which is death. So yeah. I'm waiting, and they're, they're starting to up, uh, upgrade the lines again to where they were, which will get more people down there, but not unless people feel safe. Now he's telling people who are walking the beat, you're, you're responsible for what's beneath your feet, which is tough. That's why you have transit cops. You can't tell people to watch, you know, good, you know, have a, 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 you know, what do they have, a flat screen down there that's supposed to monitor both places or a ring doorbell to watch the station while they're above? So the other thing I want to talk to you about, and I don't know where you stand. I don't know what's going on with the homeless situation. I know wherever city I go and went to 18 separate cities on my book tour, everywhere I go, there's a homeless issue. It's unbelievable. Everywhere I go. I used to say, well, California and mm-hmm. Florida because it's so nice. No, it's everywhere. North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, where was I? In uh, Dayton. Um, everywhere I go, there's homeless situation. I want you to hear what Tucker said last night, Cut 21. If you live in the United States, you may have noticed that many of our public spaces have become permanent homeless encampments. You see trash-filled tents blotting out what were once green and tidy public parks. You step over vagrants drooling unconscious on the steps of train stations on the way to work. You watch as junkies smoke meth without any embarrassment at all and then yell at pedestrians on the sidewalk, maybe at your children. Everywhere, at every intersection, there are beggars. It's what we used to imagine India was like, but this is not Calcutta. This is New York and San Francisco and Austin, Texas. So the question is, what happened? And the short answer is, our leaders did this. No matter what they tell you, homelessness is not an act of God. It's not the result of economic collapse in this country. America did not run out of housing. Instead, a determined group of well-funded ideologues decided to make it easier to live on the streets in this country while doing drugs. It's a subculture. You see these tents everywhere, right? It's unbelievable. In in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in Austin, as Tucker points out, in Miami, in a lot of places, um, there are just tent cities everywhere. And, And it's hard for me to explain to my kids who are, you know, in their early 20s, that this isn't what it used to look like in cities. And they live in cities now. And they're like, is this is this normal? No, it's not normal. It is not normal. And it reminds me of kind of what New York was like in the 70s when you had a crack cocaine epidemic that was um, devastating to this city and other cities across the country. But Tucker's right. It, it's, it's allowed to happen. And the other huge mistake that we have made is to deinstitutionalize mental health, to say, well, we want everyone on medication and mainstreamed out in society. We'll tell that to the family of the 24-year-old in California and the 40-year-old in New York because it's not working. People don't take their medication. We need well-run medical mental health institutions in these cities that can house people and that can care for them. How come these mayors aren't embarrassed by this? How come they don't get up in the morning and say, how do I fix this? They get more and more money to keep it. Gee, well, that's a good question. That's a good question. And and that, and the money is what's always the answer. We throw more money at the problem. I looked at Merrick Garland's comments because I'm thinking, where's the DOJ on this? Where is Merrick Garland out talking every day about what's going on in our cities and how the federal government can can aid local law enforcement to help, right? And so I went back. They did this $1.6 billion program where they basically sent money to different cities, right? That's not what's going to work. What's going to work is building the confidence of law enforcement, backing law enforcement, hiring more cops, hiring more police officers, and and having their back is what's going to start to make a difference. And of course, you have to do the prosecution side of the equation as well. I don't know why. I didn't understand why Bill de Blasio wasn't ashamed of what had happened to the city on his watch. And I don't understand why these mayors don't feel a personal responsibility for the deteriorating safety and the and the condition. D- doesn't anyone care anymore about the fact that the, the park looks terrible, that it should be pristine, it should be beautiful? That's why these parks were created by people who had a lot of foresight um, 150 years ago who said, let's carve a park in the middle of this city so people have a place to go, not so that people could live there in tents, you know, shooting right. up drugs. But it's happening everywhere. So you could you could tell the cops, I need that cleaned out. They will clean it out. Yeah. I need all these tents done and all these people out. I need the garbage taken Absolutely. up. And you work with sanitation and they'll do it. But right now there is no political will to do that, which blows me away because they don't vote. So usually they're, they're, they're hostage to voters. So what, you, you really think these I people think are voting? I think there's also a laziness. I think there's a laziness. A subculture? People don't want to participate no, in the country? No, not of the people who are in the tents, of the, of the leadership. I think it's like, oh, you know, that would be a lot of work to figure that out. 
Yeah, I, I really do. I, I can't understand anything else. You know, when, when you have a job and your job is to create a safe city, that's your number one responsibility, no matter whether what leadership position you're yeah. in the government, is to keep people safe. With the president, it's going to be national security. On the local level, it's going to be to keep your city safe. So check that box before you start worrying about anything else. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox, you can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.